Well, good morning or good afternoon or good evening, wherever you may be. And welcome to um, a very special, um, extra special webinar um, in our series. So this, is, this will be the 10th one that we have done in the lead up to the World Cotton Research Conference, which um, if you don't know already, um, has been postponed yet again from this year to uh, October uh, 2022, uh, still in Egypt, in, uh, in um, uh, Sharm el-Sheikh. So uh, with that being an extra special, special webinar, it's only appropriate and right that we have some extra special presenters. And I'm really delighted uh, to welcome three presenters today who are gonna give two really interesting um, presentations. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to introduce our first speaker, but before I do so, let me just remind you that if you have any questions, please enter the questions in the Q&A box. Uh, don't enter them into the chat because uh, we won't be watching the chat box. So enter them into the Q&A box. So we're going to start off uh, today's uh, presentations with a really interesting uh, title, uh, The Agony and Ecstasy of Asiatic Cotton. And uh, if that doesn't get you excited, nothing will. And I'm delighted to welcome uh, Dr. Venugopalam, um, who is the Principal Scientist for Agronomy at ICAR, the Central Institute for Cotton Research in Nagpur, India. Uh, now, Dr. Venu Gopalan has 32 years of experience as a scientist in agricultural research. His main research contributions are in polyphosphate fertilizer kinetics, carbon sequestration in rain-fed land use systems, info crop cotton simulation model and its applications, participatory land use planning techniques and organic and arboreum cotton technologies and high density cotton planting systems. He's published 127 research papers, authored 30 book chapters, 19 research bulletins and edited nine books. He's received the ICAR Team Award for Research on Carbon Sequestration in 2006. He was recognized as a Fellow of the Indian Society of Agronomy in 2014, the Indian Society for Soil Survey and Land Use Planning in 2016, and the Maharashtra Academy of Sciences in 2018. He was deputed to Malawi and Uganda as an expert under the Cotton Technical Assistance Programme for Africa in 2014. And finally, Dr. Vanyagopalan has been an executive committee member of the International Cotton Researchers Association since 2014. So with that, Dr. Vanyagopalan, the virtual floor is yours. Thank you, Kai, for this wonderful introduction. Hope I'm audible to everybody. Thank you. And my slides are already uh, there, it's been shared. Uh, namaste and greetings to one and all. I'm delighted to be here to take this opportunity to share my views on Asiatic cotton, a subject that has been very close to my heart for more than three decades. Uh, the topic which I will be speaking on is the agony and the euphoria of Asiatic cotton. Uh, when Dr. Keshav suggested he had replaced the word euphoria with ecstasy, but I would still prefer euphoria because I see a ray of hope in the research results which we have done here. And that's why, please permit me to use the word euphoria in place of ecstasy. I am a researcher working in the central part of India at the Central Institute for Cotton Research located in the geographical center of the country, a city called Nagpur in India. As you all know, as the name goes, the Asiatic cotton, which is one of the four cultivated species of cotton, the other being the hirsutum, which is the dominant one, the barbadans or extra long staple cotton, the Egyptian cotton that is, the lavender or the herbaceum cotton, and the arboreum cotton. The arboreum cotton is Asiatic in origin. It originated somewhere in the Indus Valley. And as per recent evidence, it is said that Balochistan is the center of origin of this cotton. 
arborium cotton is also known as asiatic cotton the tree cotton the ceylonis cotton nankin cotton oriental cotton red flower cotton and we in india and in pakistan know it more commonly by the vernacular name that is the desi cotton from this part of the subcontinent the asiatic cotton went to other parts of asia and africa around 1300 years ago it was introduced into china not as a fiber but as an ornamental plant now this slide here gives us the different races of arborium cotton and where it evolved and how it spread to other plant parts of the globe this is all in the old world uh, there are six races of arborium cotton the first one of the indicum is somewhere near the gujarat the indo pak border where it originated from there it spread to the african region uh, the bengalis cotton it originated for the northwards but then quickly spread to central india and got established here the sarnam or the hill cotton we call it the big bowl cotton arborium cotton it had its origin in the northeastern hills of india it is found still in the northeastern hills of india and in the hilly region of a neighboring country that is the bangladesh the sinens cotton spread over china korea and japan the burmanicum cotton in myanmar and the sudanens cotton in north africa and west africa the time scales are given in this uh, uh, slide here now first i'll talk about the ag agadi and then the euphoria the agadi is that one of the best and the finest cottons have now gone into oblivion in history there are several references about the fineness of this arborium cotton there are plenty of references on the dhaka melmel malmal or the dhaka muslin cotton and the calico cotton uh, these names were evolved probably from the ports from which these cottons were exported to other parts of the globe uh, i have put a picture of this lady here who is wearing a dress made of dhaka muslin cotton and if you see here the fineness is as fine as a, a silk rope or a dress and the next fly there is a picture of a fine calico cloth which is almost like glass you can see what is inside it that was the fineness of the arborin cotton which were once we were very proud of this cotton there was a very flourishing industry till the 191860s and it was enviously called over the world as the woven wonder or, or the woven wind now there are two events the first one the industrial revolution and the second one probably the world war 2 which brought a downfall of this region uh, of this arborium cotton in the entire old world there was a decline in the production of arborium cotton for the last two centuries and this decline accelerated after the 1950s and today arborium cotton is almost replaced by hirsutum and the barbadens cotton and less than 1% of the world cotton area is under arboriums what happened to this why are we neglecting this what are the benefits of this cotton is what i will be uh, concentrating on in my talk the asiatic versus hirsutum cotton debate it's not new it's there it's existed and it will continue to be debated for years to come the country the subcontinent we introduced the hirsutum cotton in the year 1790 the british has introduced it in india uh, and for more than 100 years several attempts were made in the country to adapt the hirsutum cotton to the subcontinent but these attempts were futile in the first conference in fact it was in 1937 and i quote from this book hybrid the history and science of plant breeding by kingsbury published in 19 uh, 2009 uh, a scientist called ramnath nayar who was working in the southern part of india in the city of coimbatore he put forward a suggestion that american cotton should be favored over the desi varieties 
and in the same meeting a famous british researcher who was working in central india in a town called indore he was uh, hutchinson who said that the potential of desi cotton has not been fully exploited and the american cotton could not be developed any further but after this meeting the country followed a pro hirsutum policy at the expense of asiatic cotton the debate continues uh, in the wcrc3 there was a paper uh, by dagonkar and aurangabadkar which said that the intra arboreum hybrids are better than the intra hirsutum hybrids under dryland conditions where marginal cultivation practices exist there was also a recent paper which was which developed a lot of controversy published in nature plants which said that the arboreum cotton could generate similar net revenue that is similar economic benefits to small holder farmers compared to the bt hirsutum cotton and should be and this cotton should be promoted uh, irrespective about uh, what happens on which side of the debate you are the harsh fact is that today less than 2% of the cotton in the country is arboreal whereas uh, at the time when we gained independence that was in 1947 48 65% of the cotton in india was under arboreums from from 65% we came down to 2% and at the same time the area under hirsutum just galloped upwards and today almost 95% i am told is under the hirsutum cotton this story is similar not only in india but in our neighboring state, countries also less than 2% of the area in pakistan is asiatic less than 5% of the cotton area in bangladesh is asiatic uh, since 1950 there is no uh, arboreum cotton in china and around the same time even in burma that is myanmar there was a large scale shift from the hirsutum towards the hirsutum cotton from the arboreum cotton the obvious reasons for these was the fiber quality now before we move further i would just like to stress upon some of the merits of this arboreum cotton and why it is important that we continue to research on the species we all know that first and foremost or the most important uh, plus point about this cotton is the pest and disease tolerance the arboreum cotton is tolerant to gadgets and aphids that is the leaf hoppers bacterial blight rust leaf curl virus and reniform nematodes i'm sure a lot of uh, breeding work is being carried out to transfer these traits into uh, american cotton and some of this work on leaf curl virus was presented by uh, one of the speakers mr rahman uh, i think it was in the first fifth or sixth uh, uh, webinar of this series arboreum cotton is also known for its drought resistance particularly when there is water shortage the roots of arboreum cotton grows doubly faster than the hirsutum cotton the root depth the root density and the root volumes are definitely higher under drought conditions in arboreum compared to the hirsutum counterparts they are more tolerant to salinity and uh, heat they have higher got than the hirsutum counterparts that is the ginning outcome is higher they are extremely adapted to poor growing conditions there is also an ease in picking because the cotton gets detached from the locules very easily so the energy required to pick particularly where you are practicing hand picking uh, it's quite easy in arboreum cotton although many may not agree with me uh, there is a higher moisture absorbency and hence it is a preferred cotton for surgical and hygiene products uh it has low propensity to shed seed coat while ginning so obviously the trash and the quality is better better light penetration and better phot photosynthesis because the leaves are okra shaped they are a hugely valued germplasm resource and used in breeding and biotech programs and most importantly they are ideal for organic cotton because there is absolutely no gm contamination possible they are different species and they don't cross with one another we at cicr did a lot of studies on the comparison of the arboreum and the hirsutum cotton through a long term fertilizer experiment started in the year 1985 
I will give uh, a couple of slides which would highlight the findings from these studies, from these experiments. These experiments were conducted under rain-fed conditions without any irrigation. They were conducted on vertisols of the black soils. Uh, if you see in this slide, I presented the seed pot and yield for a number almost uh, 15 years. The uh, bluish black bars show the arboreum and the greenish ones show the yields of the hirsutum cotton. If you see this, you will find that in 13 out of the 15 years, the arboreum cottons out yielded the hirsutum cotton and the benefits were higher in the years where the rainfall was low or drought was experienced in the, this part of where it was grown. We also did some stability analysis and sustainability analysis based on our long-term experiments. And my colleague, Dr. Blaze, who was working with me in Cotton Research Institute, he did an analysis based on uh, a regression analysis based on the approach proposed by Findlay and Wilkinson. And he concluded that the higher R square values in arboreum indicated they are more stable than their hirsutum counterparts. I and some other colleague, Mr. Tiwari, also did some work on sustainable yield index. And we also came out on a similar finding that the sustainable yield index across a number of fertility treatments, whether you uh, with fertilizer, without N, without NP, without NP and K, where you have organic, where you have partial organics, where you have low rates of fertilizers or where you have higher rates of fertilizers, the sustainable yield index of organic cotton was higher than the hirsutum cotton. But I would like to add a word of caution here that these studies were conducted prior to the introduction of BT cotton. Unfortunately, we could not carry forward the study beyond 2002 uh, when the BT cottons were actually introduced. So we don't know in the present context very well, you have the hirsutum BT hybrids, how would this arboreum perform on a, on a long uh, period of time, uh, like we have in a permanent trial uh, where it is conducted for over 10 or 12 years. We have short experiments and conclusion from short experiments uh, may not be uh, uh, that much true, and we don't have any long-term experiments after this. It's not only from yield and sustainability point of view, in terms of nitrogen use efficiency, here I have put the green bars for the arboreum and the blue bars for the hirsutum cotton, the values, the number of times the green bobs uh, I mean, uh, outperforms the blue ones are higher, indicating that the arboreums were better able to use the fertilizer nitrogen compared to the American hirsutum cotton from these long-term trials. Having said this, and having eulogized the merits of arboreum cotton, why is it not popular? And what are the reasons for this state where we have less than 2% area under this ar arboreum cotton? Obviously, there must be several demerits. There are, and a few of them are listed here. First and foremost is the bold size of the arboreum cotton is small. We have hirsutum cotton with four and a half to five grams. The arboreum cottons, the bold size or the bold weight is only two and a half to three grams. So there is always a reluctance from the farmers who sow them because they say that the laborers, the farm laborers are reluctant to pick them because in this part of the world, it is hand picking. The next one is they have low locule retention. That is, uh, the seed from the locules, the seed cotton sheds. So you need to do the picking a, a number of times, otherwise the cotton would fall on the ground and it would be difficult for us to get uh, a trash-free cotton once it falls on the ground. The third one is they are tall, indeterminate and lanky in nature. If you give them fertilizer and water, as uh, many farmers in North India do, uh, the cotton grows to almost seven or eight feet. And once they're as a bowl load in them, they tend to lodge and fall down. Obviously, the other important reason why arboreums were not preferred by the industry was the fiber was coarse, weak, and rough. They were susceptible to the pink bollworms, the gray mildew disease, and the wilt disease. Uh, moreover, the arboreums grown at the time were of longer duration compared to the hirsutum counterparts. 
and then farmers who wanted to take a second crop after cotton found it difficult to optimize the yield of the second crop and that's why they favored uh, american hirsutum cotton in favor of arborium and now a days the farmers say that since there is no bt in that farmers are still afraid that there could be a problem with american bollworm and they don't want to uh, lose their crop because there is no bt in uh, any of the arboreums so they are just not prepared to uh, say or uh, get convinced when they say that we have uh, good chemicals against uh, arborium i mean the american bollworm and for all other insect pests they have fair degree of tolerance it is very difficult to convince the farmers at this point of time but having listed these demerits i would now in the next part of the lecture talk give some idea of what we have been doing to address these how we could overcome some of these limitations and where we stand we have a huge uh, germplasm repository at our institute the cicr where more than 12500 accessions are there and if you just look at the variability uh, in the hirsutum and the arborium cottons listed here for several of these economic traits whether it is yield or bowl weight or ginning out turn and the fiber traits uh, you find that there is considerable variability in arborium as it is in the american hirsutum cotton and we can easily exploit them to overcome some of the drawbacks which i mentioned in the previous slide Uh, we have made some headway in this and i would like to uh, point some of the uh, attempts we made and the success we had in improving the uh, quality and the uh, uh, plant type of the arborium cotton and how we did some agronomy studies and we are now able to come out with a, a full fledged agronomic package for the arborium cotton that will be the next part the euphoria part of the talk that is the euphoria is that we have at least partly overcome the problem of low locule retention we now have some very good lines like i am shown in this picture cina316 which have good locule retention even when the plant is completely dry you will find all the bolts attached to the cotton plant it was not there in many of the cultivars uh, in the previous periods the low bowl weight 2 to 2.5 we have made some headway we have 3 3.25 and 3.5 gram uh, arborium cotton now the duration we could definitely bring down the duration from 180 to 200 days to somewhere around 150 days it's been a significant achievement and as far as fiber quality is concerned we did make a lot of headway and we have now materials with as good fiber quality as the best of the hirsutum cotton and these solutions available kindles a ray of hope for the future of arborium cotton in this part of the world i would like to elaborate on these achievements a little we have been using the ray sernum the ray sernum uh, is actually a shy bearer found in the northeastern hills of india and in the adjoining bangladesh the beauty of this is that one is they are non shattering with good locule retention more importantly they are big bowl size you get bowls even up to 7 and 7 and 1/2 grams per bowl in this and this trait has been transferred into cultivated arboreums with a more popular uh, arboreums like uh, traditional breeding and we have developed one line called mdlabb1 that is long linted uh, uh, arboreum big bowl one and using that we are now transferring this trait to other arborium high yielding cultivars we also developed a variety called fule danvantri which combines uh, good locule retention with big bowl weight using the genes from sarnam uh, this cotton is perhaps the most ideal one for surgical cotton in the sense that the micronere is high they are short fiber coarse cotton which has tremendous potential in medical use in hygiene products and the rest uh, my colleague in our institute did some wonderful studies dr blaze did some wonderful studies on the agronomy of this fule danvantri used for surgical cotton and he came out saying that this variety fule danvantri of asiatic cotton 
is perhaps the best suited for high density planting system. And a study showed that we can plant these arboreum cottons as close as one feet or 30 centimeters between rows and 15 centimeters or six inches between plants in a row to accommodate more than 200,000 plants per hectare. He has just published it last year and uh, the reference is available here. So this Phule Dhanvantri, ideal for surgical cotton, is amenable for high density planting. It has good locule retention and big bowl size. At this time, I would be failing in my duty if I don't mention the marvelous work done by one institute located in a small town called Parbani in central India in the state of Maharashtra. It's a very nondescript town. Uh, there is an institute, there is a research station called Mehbuba Bagh Farm, which was established in 1918. They celebrated their 100 centenary years a few years back. And I would like to remind those who are attending this webinar that in the 50s and 60s, the central India was popularly known as Central Arboreum Region. Unfortunately, we don't find any arboreums today except in the research farms. That's the irony today. But this farm, Mehboba Bagh Farm, is the only research station completely devoted for the improvement of Asiatic arboreum cotton. In the initial years of their establishment, what they did was they improved and purified the varieties or the cultures being grown by farmers and they released a few varieties called Gaurani series, Gaurani 7, 17, 24. They also did some selection from some material brought from Gujarat state of India. Uh, but I have chronologically listed a number of varieties uh, released from 1980 onwards, just to highlight a few facts. One is over the years, if you look at the column here on fiber length, a marvelous improvement has been brought in the fiber length from 20 to 21 mm in 1980 to almost 31 to 32 millimeters in fiber length. We also made significant progress in improving the ginning outturn of the cotton from 34% to 38%. More importantly, we have reduced the duration of the varieties uh, from say 180 to 190 days at that time to uh, less than almost 150 days now. And this is a big victory for us in our armory against the pink bollworm, which is a great threat now. A salute to this institute and the scientists there. Many of these work has not been recognized widely, but their work has potential to bring a change in this part of the country wherein we hope that these new arboreums will become popular. Among these varieties listed here, a variety called PA255, which was released in 1999, became quite popular among farmers. And there are studies in farmers' fields to show when you compare the performance in farmers' field uh, with the hirsutum cotton, which the farmer was growing, and the PA255 Asiatic cotton, which was introduced in the farmers' field in terms of yield, and more importantly, in the reduction in number of insecticidal sprays done, because it was compared with a non bt hirsutum cotton, we find that there is a saving in insecticide cost. Uh, yields were more or less same, or in many cases, it was better than the hirsutum cotton. Unfortunately, in the BT era, we could not move for, further with this variety called PA255, which was popularly called Parbani Thura. The list which I gave in the last slide was the improvement made in cotton through a natural selection and the conventional breeding. Uh, our scientists also attempted what is called the hirsutization of arboreum cotton. In this, polyploidy was introduced by colchicine treatment. Chromosome was doubled in arboreum. It was crossed with the hirsutum cotton, then uh, a repeated BRAC cross. And then we came out with a variety called Parbani Arboreum 402. If you see here the picture here, you will find an arboreum cotton 
with a usual symbol of the bolts bowing downwards, but the leaves appear to be hirsutized. A similar exercise was done in a neighboring state of Karnataka, where they, come out, they came out with uh, a DLSA-17 uh, that was also through this hirsutization program. Around This is all around the year 2000 when these varieties became popular. And at the same period, two more varieties called Jawahar Tapti and MDL-2463, these were re released. This is all between 2000 and 2002 when this happened, just before BT cotton was introduced into India. Uh, in my first slide, I mentioned about two books, which I drew a lot of inspiration. One was Frayed History of Indian Cotton by Meena Menon. And the other was a book uh, on the story, a revival story of Arborium cotton. The revival story of Al uh, Arborium cotton was published based on the thesis, a doctoral thesis by a researcher called Matish Chandra. So in the book, uh, a lot of analysis is there. I just summed up three important points in the slide here. Matish Chandra, along with his uh, guide or supervisor, uh, in 2011, they published two important research papers uh, where they compared four arboreal cultures, the newly developed ones, which I mentioned earlier, PA255, DLSA17, MDL2463, and Jawahar Tapti, with two most popular hirsutum cultures of the time, the LRA5166 and the Picardity Nerma. The studies concluded that the arboreum cotton was better than hirsutum cotton, and PA255 was the best for fiber length and fineness at medium count, that is the 30S count. At slightly higher, that is the 40S count, PA255 was better than LRA5166, which I must tell you, developed by our institute, was the leading variety at that time in the country for uniformity. And the fabric made from 255, PA 255, was tougher. It was had an optimum rigidity. It had better uptake, uniform dye uptake, and air permeability. These were the main findings from uh, the thesis, uh, doctoral thesis done by Matish Chandra. And this was published in the year 2011. Now, 20 years later, uh, that is, we now have some of the best arboreum varieties. One of them is PA810. Along with it, we have PA812 and PA740. These three varieties have completed the mandatory coordination trials, the regulatory approval and everything, and they were released two years back. If you look at the fiber properties, unmatchable, and you can compare it with any of the American cotton varieties popular in this part, you have a fiber length of 30 mm with matching fiber strength, uh, mic values very close to what is needed by the industry. Uh, uh, these have, I would say, this is a revolutionary step in the arboreum cotton research done in any part of the world. I just read some report from a neighboring country, Pakistan, saying that they also were able to improve the fiber length of arboreum cotton from 19 mm in the yester years to 27 mm. So it is not that it is not possible to improve arboreums. We need a little more effort in this direction. We at CICR compared several of the arboreum, long linted arboreum cultures, along with the popular BT hybrid, both for the yield and fiber quality parameters. And if you see this slide, uh, I think many of these arboreums are matching the BT2 hybrids in terms of yield. Again, I would like to add a, a caution here. There were short-term studies. These were even experimental plots. We need to upscale them, and upscale results are yet not available. But there is a ray of hope from this. We also did uh, pass on the lint from these studies to the industry, where they did some spinning consistency tests. And if you compare, this blue bar is with the Ajit 155, which is the most popular, uh, which is a popular BG2 hybrid here in this part. There are some of these long linted arboreums, which almost have similar or even better spinning consistency. And the industry is ready to uh, take these forward, provided we grow them on a large scale. 
Now, the last part of this lecture is the effort which we have initiated on developing a technology to popularize uh, these long knitted arboreums. That has been uh, my part of the research in the last few years. Uh, we did a lot of trials right from 2017 onwards. Uh, we did trials on identifying which is a best soil for arboreum, uh, what should be the spacing at which should, it should be grown, what should be the canopy management schedule, what should be the nutrient management schedule, and what would be the most optimum time of sowing in this part. And our studies indicated that uh, many of these are suitable for uh, high density planting, and uh, you can plant them at almost 100,000 plants per hectare. There is a definite yield gain when you are planting at this. Convent, uh, I mean, this is in comparison to 50,000 plants per hectare, which was recommended for the conventional arboreums, not these long legged ones. So, in comparison to the existing agronomy, the new agronomy has got certain yield advantages. We also standardized that insecticides or the marginal soils, not very deep and uh, deep soils. These are more suitable for arboreums compared to the uh, vertisols or the deep black soils. So they are uh, more suitable for uh, marginal soils where they can be pushed through and uh, upscale. The canopy management through methicot chloride as well as mechanical topping, we could standardize it. And today we have a full-fledged agronomy of arboreum cotton, right? From what soil, what spacing, what's the uh, time of sowing, when to terminate the crop, what moisture conservation to adopt, what is the fertilizer to be applied, what plant protection uh, is needed to, for these arboreums, what is the canopy management, whether you're going for mechanical detopping or application of growth regulator picks. Uh, we also recommend a foliar nitrogen spray of KNO3 during the bowl setting period so that both the seed quality and the fiber quality is improved. And post harvest, here there's a tractor mounter uh, shredder, which is shredding the cotton stocks into small pieces so that uh, we can turn down the extra carbon which is uh, generated during cotton growing back to this into the soil and it will help us in rejuvenating the soil over the long run. We now have this entire technology package with us. From this year we have started upscaling this technology in a, in a small way because of the COVID we could not upscale it in a large way but we have in cooperation with some civil society organizations. We are going to the farmer's field with the technology. Sowings have been completed and probably a year from now, I'll be able to say about the performance of these cottons but with a little more confidence. And now I would also like to refer to some of the work done by my, my uh, researchers in the Northern part of India. In the Northern part of India, yield was never a constraint. Even today you have arboreums which can beat the hirsutum cottons in yield. It was only the plant type. They grow very tall, they lodge, and the poor locule retention is the main issue. Uh, but then they have also made significant research progress. We have a set of uh, uh, good arboreums, which are short staple. We have another set of arboreums, uh, which are medium staple. And uh, the short staples are used for absorbent cotton, for surgical cotton, for med medical uses, for hygiene products, for mattresses. The medium staple cotton are used for ring spinning, although the modern spinning systems are, don't accept this because they are not suitable for height and spinnings. Uh, it has been an observation from our side that whenever there is an epidemic of cotton leaf curl virus, uh, the next year the demand for these arboreans go up. So whenever there is a fear of cotton leaf curl, the farmers switch over to arboreum cotton, they approach our research institutes for seeds of this, there are still some farmers who continuously come to research station and say that we need seeds of these arboreans at least for a few acres where we would like to try uh, upscale them. But unfortunately, we are not able to uh, match up with the uh, aggressive uh, hybrid campaign, which has almost eaten away the entire arboreum, arboreum cotton area in the country. And I think I'll be summing up uh, my talk by saying that across the world today, arboreum cottons are used for hirsutum breeding cotton program for host, host plant resistance, obviously to transfer the traits 
for biotic and abiotic stress resistance. But my opinion is that the cotton germplasm of Asiatic cotton has got enough variability for yield, for yield attributes, for maturity, and for all those drawbacks which were uh, there in the erstwhile arboreum cotton. We should directly exploit this variability to overcome the drawback rather than uh, converting our, uh, I mean, uh, hirsutum background and putting them into hirsutum background. Uh, the other thing is, we have been doing some head, maybe we did some research and those research, uh, I made uh, a small glimpse of it in the last present, uh, few slides. What I believe is today, we have enough arboreum cotton with good quality, which can act as potential game, game changers to break the yield barriers for the central India. Uh, we can reduce the production costs. They are particularly suited for the fragile environment and the climate change and climate variability scenario where these arboreum cottons are best adopted. They can also be pushed through to our organic cotton farmer because the main problem faced in the hirsutum cotton based organic farming is contamination of GMO cotton and this could be a lasting solution. I firmly believe that upscaling Asiatic cotton to its pristine past will be possible with international cooperation in R&D and backing of a textile industry. And I look forward, we have prepared a roadmap to at least convert 10% of the area back into the arboreum cotton. Our institute has prepared our a roadmap for this and I'm hopeful one day, sooner than later, we will achieve it. I think this is my last slide. I'm profusely thankful to the ICAC for providing me an opportunity, a platform, a virtual one to address a number of cotton researchers from across the globe. Thank you once again. I would like to thank the present and the previous directors of ICR, my heads of division, and all those who supported me in this uh, Asiatic Cotton Research Program. Uh, and finally, before I end, I would dedicate this uh, talk in memory of my colleagues, Mr. Nitin and Ms. Shubangi, who are no more with us. They were as passionate as me to work with organic uh, Asiatic cotton. Uh, they were there in the field. They were there with me in laying out experiments, in taking observations, in chemical analysis in the lab. Unfortunately, they passed away battling COVID in April and May this year. And I dedicate this talk to them. Thank you for the patient listening. Thank you, Vanada. Well, thank you, Dr. Venugopalan. And, um, and thank you also for reminding us of um, not just um, two of your colleagues that have passed away due to COVID-19, but um, many others that we may have known um, that have also passed away, and we, we do remember them as well. Um, I'm going to go straight into the, um, uh, to the questions, uh, and I'm going to start with one that I was actually going to, I was thinking of as well, which is from Dr. Mortuza. And um, he says, is it possible to revive muslin cotton on our subcontinent? Hmm. I think you can get the cotton, but to get the craftsmen of that, uh, that experienced craftsmen who used to weave ordinary cotton into such magic uh, textiles, uh, it, it, that art is somewhere missing. I mean, we may have cotton of the quality, but the art of spinning them into that muslin type we nearly, it will take a long time. I don't know. The artisans of that period were real uh, uh, wonderful people who could do it at that time with traditional equipments. Uh, today with modernized uh, equipments, we can, but I don't know how much we can match those fineness of the yester years. Uh, uh, it's still, Venu, uh, yeah. If I may add, you know, just taking the liberty to add, if, uh, yeah. like that is if you're finished with your answer. Yeah. So can I uh, add something? Yeah. Quality wise, we have made improvement, but with ordinary quality of cotton, the craftsmen of that era could, uh, I mean, uh, convert that cotton into the finest fabric. Somewhere that art has not traditionally passed down for generations. We may have to cultivate that art. Science part is easy, but art will definitely take time. Yeah, thank you, Venu. Uh, I'd, I'd just like to add to this. Uh, there are actually two factors. One is uh, in Bangladesh, uh, uh, 
on the banks of Meghna River, this species, which is called Gossypium arboreum, and then variety like Neglecta, was the one. Those fibers were used for Dhaka muslins. And the painting that you showed, you know, like a Francisco Rinaldi, which was 1980, 1789 1980. or 1790, was an authentic representation of that uh, fabric. I mean, it was you know, like a woman wearing that. Now, there's a person called Dr. Islam in Bangladesh, who for nearly 15 years, as much as I know, has been trying to locate and revive this species, which is Gossypium arboreum variety neglecta. And uh, he did find, uh, and what is very commendable is Dr. Islam also tried to locate those artisans, those killed, uh, whatever you can call them, skilled artists who would actually weave because these fibers need a lot of humidity. In fact, they would go on boats during the night also to weave. Um, I mean, I'm saying night because they say that the humidity was more anyway. I mean, there, there are many stories on that. Uh, but I would recommend, uh, you know, like all the listeners today, all the participants to go through a news article which came in BBC uh, probably March uh, the title was The Ancient Fabric uh, That No One Knows How to Make. Now, that is a beautiful article. It is actually one of the finest on Dhaka Muslims in recent times. Uh, if, if you Google, you'll get this. It is the ancient fabric that no one knows how to make. What Islam discovered was, what Dr. Islam discovered was, after he put together these artists, they were able to spin these fibers to 300 counts, whereas the original Dhaka Muslims were 1,200 counts. They're still trying, but it is commendable. Let us hope, all of us, let us hope that we revive this fabric again. Yeah, thanks, Dr. Venu. Thank I was, you, you know, like I thought I'll just supplement your... Thanks a lot. Thanks for the addition. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'm going to try and um, bring quite a few uh, questions all together now. Um, there's one from uh, Dilip Monga, well, there's two from Dilip Monga, and then there are a couple that are associated with one of his questions. So the first one is... What are your views about her suitization of Desi cottons? Is that a word? Who cites? Anyway, um, it is practically, is it practically a good or bad idea? And what can be the few out of the box ideas for bringing a sizable area under Desi cottons in India? And there have been a couple of other um, uh, attendees who've also asked a, a similar question about how can we, how can we increase um, the area and increase the amount of, um, uh, Asiatic um, cotton in India? Mm. I would uh, lay my bet on the traditional improvement work because we could get the best quality from the existing variability itself. A hirsutization is time taking. It's, uh, it's not very easy uh, and it should be resorted when the other options are closed. That's my personal view. Uh, there are some work going on both uh, in the North India and in Pakistan where they are trying to uh, put in trades from arborium cotton into hirsutum for leaf curl virus uh, resistance. But I, what I believe is so long as you have uh, variability within arborium, we can exploit it first, best. That is easy. Uh, it's simple. And uh, wherever you don't have some trades, only then we need to go for uh, some other species. Uh, I'm not sure whether the breeders agree with me. But I believe that would be a workable solution because unless you completely exploit the variability available in the uh, same species, uh, because the adaptation and the other things, uh, stability of this trait would be better if you are taking it from the same species. Okay, there's, um, there's a couple there, of... There was one more question. I think uh, the part B, I missed it. Uh, about views on upscaling it. Yes, it is. Yes, and uh, increasing the area, etc. Yeah. Uh, Upscaling, uh, definitely we need to have a roadmap, a timeline, and how we do it. We need to partner with industries. We need to partner with NGOs, with civil society organizations, with government support. Because today, we need the farming community to be sensitized, and they need to be convinced that it is possible to grow arborium cotton. Where you have been growing, uh, the BG2 hybrids, particularly in those places where the soils are marginal to begin with, because these cottons with half the price, half the cultivation cost, they can give you sustainable eats. Once the farmers are convinced, we can slowly start upscaling it. We have 
prepared a 10 year roadmap on how to move from this 2% to 10% and we are roping in uh, different partners with a definite plan on upscaling our boarding cotton in the country uh, dr venu if i may add again i'm sorry to butt in <laughs> but uh, yeah no, it is uh, i i also feel that there's a lot of scope for arborium cotton and organic cotton one because uh, these varieties are robust and right now the fiber traits are also very good up to 32 mm and the strength is good got is good so which also helps to increase in yields but at the same time the possibility of contamination with bt cotton is zero so therefore uh, whatever demand the organic cotton people have for non gm cotton can actually be met but what is needed is good adaptability trials and sure. so to that's what we have done now yeah. yeah so specifically to dr munga's question is there an out of the box idea i would call is uh, this as an inbox idea for india uh, where there is a demand for non gm seeds and uh, the desi cotton can actually fulfill that and uh, i think you've most probably answered rajiv barua's uh, question which was the merits of arborium cannot be doubted my question is why are not organic projects making a beeline for the same there <laughs> okay. is no question of gmo contamination yeah. and I'll, i'll answer that uh, yeah actually what had happened is uh, uh, the organic industry wants textile uh, i mean the fiber which is 28 mm and above until 2 years back varieties with 29 and 30 mm fiber length were not available with us the varieties released earlier were about 25 26 mm in fiber length with matching strength that was not what the high end organic industry uh, was looking for but today we have i said these three varieties pa812 810 and 740 were released in 2019 and 2020 now this is the time wherein we have the best of the varieties and and a technology and a demand for upscaling it through the organic cotton route and probably organic cotton uh, the that sector or that segment can take these varieties to upscale as just now how what that what keshav just chipped in and told me the earlier the Ar Ar arborium cottons were not exactly uh, suitable in terms of the quality with the organic high end uh, industry was looking for because it was going for the uh, most finest fabrics okay um dr cranty there are some questions for you personally to answer but i'm going to go to um one from adriana gregelin who um uh, congratulates you on your your efforts uh, venu and uh, says this type of cotton could this type of cotton be good a good option for small farmers for handicrafts true uh, uh, there are some farmers even in the northern part of india my previous director dr kaira was saying that if you give them a small uh, homemade uh, uh, spinning and ginning unit uh, you, you can start with a couple of farmers or a households wherein you can start in their backyards and expand it in half an acre or a, a, a small area wherein they can where this could be a good livelihood option uh, it could be similar in other countries also where you have small holders they can try it because the investment needed in cultivating this cotton is very less compared to the other types of cotton whether it is american or the egyptian cotton input requirement is less they are sturdy and uh, they can give if not very high yield but stable yields across a range of climates uh, and that would be a good option for small holders um right i think um we're back up we we there's quite a few really talking about the upscaling bit and um encouraging um the growth of um arborium um what organizations working for sustainable cotton what can they do for arborium revival um it's one yeah i think we've really sort of answered that unless you want to add anything else into that uh, the first question. thing is we need a location specific adaptation adaptability trial uh, which among these will uh, perform in which part of the uh, country or the region we are growing and which is the best one and suppose we narrow down to the best one we can uh, quickly tweak the agronomy of it and try to popularize it in that region uh, we can have a seed production system 
we can uh, rope in other partners who are uh, ready to purchase this cotton because unless the entire supply chain is in place it would be disastrous to go in for this so you do uh, there may be some uh, ginners who have to be exclusively identified so this cotton is exclusively gin taken to uh, through the supply chain you should have a commitment from uh, a seed production growing uh, marketing ginning and the post production so that there is a viable supply chain in place then only we can popularize this otherwise a knee jerk um, those may not be a long term solution and and the end the farmer may not get the extra rewards which he is otherwise en uh, entitled to by cultivating an indigenous cotton okay thank you from punam punam uh, can a borium cotton be used for hand knotted carpet weaving i think the cords or boreums can be used yeah okay um Keshav, can you see any others that uh, there's one for you, certainly, but there's one from um, uh, Dr. Tabib. Uh, thank you, Dr. Venugopalam, for your informative presentation on Asiatic cotton. We are enriched in Asiatic cotton and beca become hopeful for cotton production in Bangladesh. My first question is the volume of Asiatic cotton market in the world. And the second one, how cotton varieties that you, how the cotton varieties you mentioned in your presentation are developed and are those varieties cultivated in the farmer's field in India? Is there any yeah. scope to work together on Asiatic cotton? I think I got that right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> the last one is yes, obviously, provided yeah. uh, we have a common program to work on. Uh, the first thing is, uh, the volume of uh, Asiatic cotton, at the end of the day, the industry looks for quality traits, irrespective of whether they are coming from organic, uh, the Barbadans or the hirsutum cotton. If they meet the quality requirements, uh, the source is immaterial. So now we have uh, quality of our arboreums matching the quality of hirsutum cottons. So uh, it should go into the uh, textile stream without any discrimination. So uh, there is no need of a separate volume or a separate segment for uh, Asiatic cotton. Separate segment can be created for organic cotton through arboreum root. Uh, these are the two things. Uh, was there anything else which he asked uh, about no, the variety? It. Definitely. No, the, the, variety, yes, okay. the variety, the last three varieties which I mentioned were released in the year uh, 2019 and 2020. Uh, the seed production chain has just started. This year we are doing some adaptation trial in farmer's field. This is the first step towards upscaling them. Thank you. And there's a comment from Dr. Rajput, who says, as Dr. Venugopalam mentioned about the plan to conduct demonstrations, but the availability of the seed of the arboreum varieties will also be a challenge while going forward. So just to Very comment. Very correct, sir. Uh, uh, unless we have a full plan right from uh, breeder seed, uh, nucleus seed to breeder, breeder to certified seed, and then uh, just we need to map what will be the area each year, how we are going to expand and have a strong seed production program in place, then go for demonstrations, then go for expansion. Uh, it has to be a very well chalked out plan. Uh, we at the Institute have made a 10 year plan for this. And I'm hopeful that with support of different partners, we will be able to move ahead if not a 10%, we can come to somewhere around 7 or 8% if we all work together. And I'm looking forward for the industry, the NGOs, the others uh, to support us in this venture because ultimately this cotton belongs to us. And that feeling, that passion is there in, within me. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so Keshav, there's one here from Hetal Shah. Perhaps you um, better answer that one. Yeah. Uh, actually, Hetal Shah is asking, uh, he's, he's concerned about the sustainability of Bt cotton, and he's also concerned about the illegal HTBT, which is herbicide tolerant Bt cotton. Now, with reference to desi cotton uh, and, and sustainability, it would be a long answer, but uh, I share his concerns completely that, uh, you know, like Bt cotton sustainability issues are important because, especially because uh, of the pingbolone resistance to Bt cotton. 
And uh, like CICR is certainly doing a good job. They're trying to address it. Illegal HTBT cotton is a major concern, uh, primarily because small scale, small older farmers, uh, they take up sprays of glyphosate directly and direct exposure of glyphosate on their body, you know, I mean, uh, onto, uh, in, in water, on farm animals, all that is a concern because uh, today the safety has become questionable with the WHO uh, categorizing glyphosate as a class 2A, which is a probable carcinogen. So therefore India needs to be very careful, not just a concern about illegal HTBT, but also a concern about uh, the use of glyphosate, which should not be used on cotton because glyphosate is not permitted on cotton in India. It's, a, it's, it's only permitted for tea as well as for non-cropped areas. So this is a concern and thank you, Dr. Hethel for, you know, uh, for asking this one. But uh, uh, yeah, I mean, with reference to the sustainability of Asiatic cotton, I think we will uh, be in touch so that we can discuss more on this, uh, not in this forum uh, due to shortage of time. Thank you. Okay, so Keshav, have we answered, I think I'm, I'm just reading through the questions again, I think uh, from a quick glance through, I think we have answered all of them. Can you just check, please? Yeah, I think uh, like everything is answered. It is just that like Tabib was asking, how are these uh, cottons made, the long staple? And uh, like Dr. Monga also mentioned, these were based on hirsutization as well. And also from the internal uh, st strength, yeah. it, is, uh, it was based on variability. And there was also a, a question in terms of, you know, like the uh, use, uh, you know, like on out of the box. Now, uh, all of us in India know, uh, I mean, those who are working on uh, Asiatic cottons know that uh, short staple cotton is also uh, well suited for denims. And uh, it, in fact, there was a possibility of that being commercially used for organic denims, not just for absorbent cotton. So some of those uses can, uh, bring up the demand for sustainable, organically produced uh, Asiatic cotton, which is not really possible with, uh, you know, with hirsutum cotton uh, right now. So mm -hmm. there are opportunities, but it all depends on the researchers and policymakers of India. Uh, I think with that, probably we would have answered everything. I, I was okay. just going through some of them, but... Uh, uh, that's, yep. that's good because we're we're out of time now. Um, <laughs> what I would say is, uh, Venu, just have a quick look through the the questions whilst we're um, when, whilst we're doing the next presentation. If you yep. see anything in there that we haven't answered, um, please type an answer. Um, yeah. so I'm available on mail anytime. You can yes. great. Uh, thank you thank very you. much indeed. Thanks a lot. Namaste. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor Venu. And so, and really a big thank you to to you. Very interesting presentation. Um, and we're going to go very quickly to our next two presenters, um, who are great friends of um, ours at ICAC. And we're I'm delighted to welcome um, Dr. Jesse Daystar, who's the Chief Sustainability Officer and Vice President of Sustainability at Cotton Incorporated. And he's joined by Dr. Ed Barnes, who is the Senior Director, Agricultural and Environmental Research Division at Cotton Incorporated. And uh, they're going to be talking about uh, making sense of cotton water requirements and water metrics. So let me just quickly um, um, introduce each one. Um, uh, Dr. Ed Barnes has been at the, the cutting edge of efforts to increase the automate, automation of cotton production systems. For the last 18 years, Ed has managed agricultural engineering related projects, including programs on precision farming, ginning, irrigation management, conservation tillage, and cotton harvest systems. He's also played a significant role in documenting cotton's progress in reducing its environmental footprint, while at the same time increasing productivity. And he currently serves on the Science Advisory Council of Field to Market, the Alliance for Sustainable Agriculture. Ed is also a fellow of the American Society of Biological and Agricultural Engineers. Um, he was honored with the National Cotton Ginners Association's Charles C. Owen Distinguished Service Award in 2019, the National Conservation System Precision Agricultural Researcher of the Year Award in 2013, and in 2014, 
the ASABE Mayfield Cotton Engineer of the Year Award. So then we, uh, let me just introduce Jesse, Dr. Jesse Daystar. He's an adjunct professor at the Duke Nicholas School of the Environment. Uh, Jesse has, is a, is, he's leading efforts in the cotton industry towards a more regenerative and sustainable future through supporting research and outreach programs aimed at implementing best science and practices in the soil and throughout the supply chain. Uh, Jesse holds a PhD in forest biomaterials from North Carolina State University and has established himself as a leader in cellulosic fiber sustainability. He has led research and consulting in aspects of product sustainability, biomaterials, biochemicals, and bio bioenergy. And his research has produced numerous publications. So with that, I am gonna hand over to the team from Cotton Incorporated. The virtual floor is now yours. Thank you very much, Guy. I um, need to share my screen real quick. All right, is that looking uh, appropriate on your side of the screen here? Looks okay. good. Yep, looks right. good. Well, great, thank you very much. It's uh, really a pleasure to be here and to talk about this important subject around water. Uh, if you pay attention to the news or what is said in terms of sustainability in cotton, you see a lot of conflicting messaging ar around water and the requirements that cotton has. There's been a lot of misinformation or outdated information or just ways in which data has been used incorrectly that has really been a challenge for us at Cotton Incorporated and for the cotton industry to communicate effectively and accurately around cotton and water. As part of this webinar, we, we were asked to speak something towards life cycle assessment. We thought that water would be a very good starting point to really uh, communicate in a high level, but also dig into the improvements and what we're doing to get better. So through the, throughout this presentation and some additional resources, which we'll share at the end, we hope that you can come away with a much higher level of the understanding of how much water cotton needs, how we speak about water, and the sustainability aspects of that water. All right, so water cycle, we have to really put this in context here at a very high level. Uh, first, you know, it's the cycle. We use water, it perhaps is changing location, changing form, ice, liquid, gas, but it's not leaving our atmosphere. It is cycled around through the atmosphere for various purposes. If we weren't growing cotton, if humans weren't here, there'd be rain, there'd be evaporations, plants would certainly use that rainwater. Uh, but now that we are here, we want to make sure that if we are going to um, meet our needs as a society, that we use both rainwater and any other surface water, irrigation, for example, in an effective means. And it's important that we do use our renewable resources and harness the value we can from that in a way in which we can avoid using non-renewable resources because those are a finite amount. So it's important that we use not only the water cycle, but other cycles such as the carbon cycle as we do with cotton fiber, as opposed to say polyester, which is extracting the non-renewable fossil fuel. So in context of, of cotton, we wanna make sure that we are using uh, water effectively, efficiently, and responsibly. One way in which we look at our overall uh, environmental impact is life cycle assessment. That's something that I specialized in uh, throughout my PhD, something I taught at the Duke Nicholas School of the Environment, and also how I really started working with Cotton Incorporated as a consultant, where I helped with the life cycle assessment, as you see so, uh, cited down at the very bottom of the slide. In this life cycle assessment, we looked at the environmental impacts of various pieces of clothing, t-shirts, collar shirt, and, and a pair of pants, and we measured all the, amount, all the amounts of inputs, such as water, energy, any kind of chemicals, fertilizers, for example, across its entire life cycle from the raw material manufacturing, when we dye and finish, knit and everything, making the garment. Uh, as a consumer, we measure how, much, how many times you wash and dry that, how much energy is needed to dry that. It's quite energy intensive, in fact, as you'll see in a moment how much water was used there, and ultimately what happens at the end of life when we either recycle it, donate it, uh, dispose of it in a landfill, those types of things. And we measure all the outputs to the environment, such as CO2, methane, how much waste and mass, and also co-products. 
Throughout all of this, we have a better understanding of where the environmental impacts occur and what we might do about them to reduce them into the future. This is all a strategic way in which we, we look at the overall environmental impacts. And this is uh, methodology is defined by the ISO standard uh, 14044. So to give you a little more background on this study, we'll do a brief overview of our environmental impacts from our LCA. Uh, we looked at cotton cultivated uh, in a few areas of the world, the US, China, India, and Australia, represented about 68% of the world production. And then we did a global perspective on uh, the manufacturing of the fabric and also the use and end of life. And we measured all the emissions to air, soil, and water, as well as the resources required to make these garments. So here's a bar chart. I got a couple of those coming up, so hopefully I can explain them without uh, too much um, bar charting you to death. So here uh, represents the total impact at 100%. The colors represent the different phases of that life cycle. For example, the green represents growing the cotton, the aspect of the seed to the bale. And then the yellow, uh, well, the blue first is a textile manufacturing that's taking the cotton and making it into a piece of clothing. The use and disposal represents what we're doing right now, wearing the clothing and ultimately what will happen to it when we're done with it. And then a little bit of transportation but that barely shows up on any environmental impact here. So when looking at this, you can see that textile manufacturing and consumer use and disposal really dominate both energy and the global warming potential of a, a t-shirt here. It really is the primary driver. Not to say that the cotton agriculture does not contribute to those because it does, uh, but it's really the primary driver of those. And that's highly related to the amount of energy required to not only wash and dry clothing, but also make the clothing. But on the right side of this chart, you can see that water quality and water consumption is more dominated by the seed to bale aspect of the life cycle, meaning irrigation during the cultivation of cotton, as well as any kind of nutrients that may make their way off the farm that certainly contributes to the overall water quality impacts. That being said, there is certainly water quality impacts associated with the washing, dyeing, and finishing. That certainly contributes, as you can see, as well as any kind of wastewater from washing and drying clothing as a consumer. So in order to better understand how water impacts the environment and how we actually speak to really defining the terms around water, it's important that we have a certain vocabulary because water use is not water consumption. There's a water footprint. There's water scarcity. There's a lot of water X, you know, a lot of ways to describe water. And in popular literature and like magazine trade journals, oftentimes uh, this is mixed up. Water use is a very distinct term that has a very distinct definition. However, even in common language, I sometimes mess that up. So it's important to have these definitions clear so that way we can better understand the impacts and what we might do about those impacts. So we're going to get into some good uh, terminology here in the next few slides. So water use or water withdrawal. Uh, this is a very important term. So you might say, how much water does cotton use? Well, are you wanting consumption like an irrigation or you wanna know the use? Cause that really matters. So to define water use, it is here, water that has been withdrawn or required for a process of product, regardless of whether it is returned, uh, whether it is returned or removed from the watershed. So it's the entire amount of water that uh, a product is needed and touches. Water consumption would be the amount of water that is actually removed from the watershed and, for example, is evaporated from a cotton farm. Or if you're making Coca-Cola, for example, you might uh, take water from a, a certain source and then you're going to ship that to another location where a consumer will drink it. So you can think of water consumption as using, for in cotton's example, irrigation that is uh, put onto a field that the plant might grow and through the growing process, trans evaporation, we have evaporation occurring and that water is put up into a cloud and it might go rain on another cotton farm nearby, but that's outside of the watershed. So that is a consumption. And that's generally what the industry and what sustainability people want to focus on. However, it's important to remember that if there is no water available uh, in water, like in a stream for power production or fossil fuel extraction and refining, there's a certain risk there for sure. If the water dries up, you can no longer make, say, polyester or refine certain fuels. So both water use and water consumption are important. Uh, another point to call out here is that when you compare water consumption, um, certainly irrigation is a driver there. But for water use, uh, energy production and energy use is the primary driver of that. 
Uh, and that is both for polyester type fibers as well as for really manufacturing the cotton garment. Those are really where the, the energy is associated and the water use. So just to kind of really kind of example here, uh, a power plant, it requires water. Uh, the consumption is the amount of water that perhaps is taken from the river and is evaporated through a cooling tower, as you see here. That, that mist always, as a kid, always wondered what that was. As an engineer now, I know that that is just water vapor being uh, evaporated. So that is now going up into the air and is no longer in that watershed. The withdrawal would be uh, including the consumption, but also the amount of water that perhaps is used and is put back into that river. For example, we have a nuclear power plant nearby Raleigh, North Carolina, where I live, and there's a lake that they borrow water from, they cool that with that water, and then return that water back to the lake. It creates a little bit warmer of a lake, but the water, large majority of it, stays in that watershed, and that would be water use. So there's two distinct terms that mean very distinctly different things. Commonly, people say, water use when they really want to refer to water consumption. So throughout this presentation, be aware that those two terms are very different. Um, so in this next slide here, we're diving into uh, in more detail, both the water consumption and the water use. And here we also have blue water consumption and blue water use, which would represent uh, surface water, for example, from a, a well or a lake or a river. So as you can see here, the seed to bale uh, certainly contributes the most to the overall life cycle, as I mentioned earlier. But when we look at water use, which I did not show previously, the manufacturing of the textile um, because of the energy, as I mentioned earlier, and the cut and sew use and disposal, those are really the dominators of the blue water use, meaning it borrows the water for a little while and it's going to give a lot of it back. So it depends on what you're talking about in terms of water as to, to what's the driver of the overall um, metric here. When you look at it on absolute terms instead of a percentage, you can see that the blue water use is actually uh, a greatly higher number than the consumption. And again, that is uh, driven from the mainly the energy required to make these products and the, the energy to, to, to make the knit, cut and sew, and energy for dyeing and finishing and washing and drying your clothing. Whereas the consumption is primarily driven from irrigation. So the use and the consumption, that is what we would like to term as a life cycle inventory number, meaning it does not necessarily relate to impacting a person and an environment or an animal. It is just a measure of flows. And within a life cycle assessment, that is an important measurement, like how much energy is required or how much CO2 and methane are released into the environment. But for example, CO2 and methane, we know that, uh, or it's, it's well um, aware that the world knows that methane has a higher global warming potential than CO2. And they're not exactly the same, but we want to measure them on a level playing field to better understand their contribution to the global warming impacts and the insulation of the atmosphere. So taking water use and water consumption and translating that into something that relates more so to the environmental impacts is an important thing to consider. There's multiple ways which we, we do that, and we'll go through two of the primary ways uh, at a high level here. There's certainly more here that we could get into, but we're going to keep it at a pretty high level. So first, we're going to talk about water footprint and then the available water remaining methodology. Uh, both, as you can see here, if you want to learn more, websites are listed there, and there's a lot of great resources to, to really better understand this if you so desire. So the water footprint of a product um, is defined here. So it's an empirical indicator of how much water is consumed, again, not used, but consumed, meaning removed from a, um, a, range, a watershed, uh, when and where measured over the whole supply chain of a product, meaning from the extraction of the raw material to using the garment, for example, and ultimately disposing of it, how much water is consumed. That being said, it's broken down into three different categories. We have a green water footprint, which as you can see here is the volume of rainwater evaporated or incorporated into a product. So that's referring to what water falls out of the air. If it's a grass, uh, rain fed cotton field, well, that's gonna be that you're not gonna have any blue water footprint for, for the cotton cultivation. Uh, but the, the green water certainly is, is a number here. However, 
it's largely thought that uh, using or consuming, as I, it's hard to keep those words straight, but consuming rainwater has less impact than perhaps blue water because it is falling and would likely otherwise just evaporate. So might as well as harness some benefit from that green water in creating a plant. The blue water footprint is a volume of surface water or groundwater evaporated or incorporated into a product. And that's like if you have a river, a lake, or perhaps a well, the amount of water that you're taking out of that source, uh, irrigating onto a farm that's evaporating into the air, that quantity would be the blue water footprint. And then ultimately the final one, we have the gray water footprint. And that's the volume of water needed to assimilate pollution, meaning uh, if you have a pollutant coming off a farm or out of a wastewater treatment plant, you have to dilute that to a certain level to make it acceptable uh, uh, within the regulations and the environmental load in that region. So it's the amount of the dilution water that is required to um, assimilate the pollution. All that together would be defined when you sum these three measures, that's your water footprint. So next we're going to talk just a bit about the available water remaining methodology. So this incorporates a concept around water scarcity. So water scarcity is the uh, inability to have water that maybe a society or environmental needs. Uh, so within the different colors here, you see the global map. Um, blue would represent little to no water scarcity. Uh, and that's a large part of the United States where we are. There's also economic um, scarcity and physical scarcity to point out here. Physical scarcity means, for example, in the Southwest, there just isn't a lot of water actually there. Um, economic scarcity, as you may see here in some of Central and America and Africa, is just there's economic barriers to having clean and available water due to infrastructure uh, type things. So there's different relative uh, drivers of scarcity, but essentially is how much water is available to meet the needs of society and the environment. So when you mention water use and water consumption, those are again, uh, me just measures of flows. It doesn't relate to what the impact actually is in the environment. So we have to ask the right question. And the group of uh, researchers who developed this, the Water Use and Life Cycle Assessment Group, WOLCA, as you see here, uh, they engage a multi-stakeholder group to, to create this methodology that translate, translates a life cycle inventory into a midpoint indicator or a, a way in which we can better understand the impacts of inter our interactions with water on the environment. So the question that they asked and is important to ask is what is the potential of depriving another user of water human or ecosystem, meaning a person or the environment and the, the fish, for example, when consuming water in this area. So if we produce more cotton, what is the potential of depriving the fish or that human who lives in that area of water? And that relates, again, that's more of an impact. What is occurring? What's the, what's the potential to deprive the other users by using water? So that's the core concept there that gets more towards the impact and further away from just the measurement of a flow. And there's a lot more there, and we actually cover more of that in Cotton Works webinars, and you can certainly go to the website uh, to learn more there. Um, so in terms of where we are within the industry, the United States has a great data collection system from the USDA and Field to Market the Alliance for Sustainable Agriculture. And the National Indicator Report in 2016 has shown that all these different indicators, land use, soil loss, water, energy, and greenhouse gas emissions have shown remarkable progress through time over the last 35 years. Uh, I want to just certainly point out the water use efficiency there with water. We've improved by 79%. That's a significant improvement that Ed will certainly mention in terms of how we've gotten there and the improvements through time and where we want to go into the future. But the industry has made a great improvement in the United States, but also globally as we uh, certainly take new technologies around the world and use better technology and learn more about irrigation. And the researchers on this call, I'm sure, have contributed to the ability to improve water use efficiency on our farms. In the United States, uh, we've not only looked at the past to now, but we're really focusing on the future because the users of our cottons, the brands, as well as consumers are really looking towards, well, here we are, um, maybe you've been sustainable in the past, but the world needs to be even more sustainable into the future. And we all have to be part of that shared solution. And the US cotton industry is taking a leadership role by creating 10 year sustainability goals to be met by 2025. As you can see here, 
the U.S. industry would like to improve soil carbon by 30 percent, improve land use efficiency by 13 percent, while reducing soil loss per acre by 50 percent, uh, reducing energy by 15 percent, water use by 18 percent, and greenhouse gas emissions by 39 percent. And the 39 percent actually correlates over to the Paris Climate Accord. So all these goals are certainly very important to our consumer of cotton, as well as to the industry, because Sustainability is important in order to be continuing to produce cotton in the future, particularly around water. Our ability to efficiently use water means that we'll have more water in the future to use, making it possible to continue to grow cotton. It's not only good for the environment, but sustainability can be critical to the overall operations on a farm. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Ed Barnes, where he will describe in more detail the track record and, uh, and how cotton interacts with water. Go ahead, Ed. Hey, thank you, Dr. Daystar. You know, we're very fortunate that Jesse has joined our team. Obviously, he was just, you know, giving you some great details on the water metrics. He's, you know, his team is tracking these metrics for cotton and helping make sure that people portray these things honestly. And so we're really fortunate uh, that someone with his background is working on the behalf of cotton now. So I really appreciate that. If we go to the next slide, I want to just start out with some key of our, some key talking points around the agronomic aspects of cotton and water. And as you heard in our previous presenter discuss, uh, all gazippium species are actually very, you know, drought and heat tolerant. Many of you are, are cotton breeders or physiologists and you understand this. And I think as an industry, we need to hammer home this point that because cotton is very drought and heat tolerant, it is grown in areas that are arid and often water limited. So it's guilt by association sometimes that cotton is portrayed as a, as a thirsty crop. In reality, it's, it's a very uh, drought and heat tolerant crop. And so it grows in places where other crops can't. And just to quickly point out two things that lead to this heat or drought tolerance, one, of course, uh, cotton is an indeterminate in terms of its flowering pattern. So, you know, once it hits about 35 days of age, it begins flowering and continues uh, flowering and producing fruit until it's harvested. So that means there's not one growth period uh, where if it's uh, in a drought that it won't, you know, it can and it can take a break. And then when the drought's over, it'll start flowering again and producing fruit. In contrast to some grasses like corn or, you know, uh, ZMAs, that has a very defined flowering period. And if it's in a drought in that flowering period, you just don't get any corn. So there's the, the physiology advantage there. And also in this slide illustrates on the left, you see a cotton plant that's probably between 30 and 40 days old and it doesn't look very big. But what we don't see is what's going below the surface pictured on the right, that cotton will put most of its energy early in its life cycle uh, to developing its root system so that it can tap into stored moisture. So that's another uh, reason that cotton is drought tolerant. So just keep that point in mind. And on our next slide, I want to point out a very key uh, metric. And this one, I think we're, we've talked a lot about numbers. And I think these are, it's important that we talk about these numbers so we can kind of figure out you know, different context, how much water is needed for a t-shirt, how much, and we're going to talk about how much water is needed for a kilogram of cotton. But this one, I think, is, is a, a real key message, that when you look at agricultural water use, now this pie is not how much water humanity uses, it's not how much water it's on the planet, it's how much water is used in agriculture. And you can see some of the crops pointed out there, uh, and cotton's only 3% of agricultural water use globally. So we're not a huge water user. And actually our water use is proportional to our land use. And so with that 3% land and 3% water or less than 3 to 3% land, we're meeting more than, you know, depending on what metric you wanna use over 30% of humanity's uh, fiber needs. So that is a, a very, I would say a very appropriate and very uh, efficient use of those resources. So just keep this number in mind as we go. Uh, and let's turn now to the next slide and some different numbers. And so uh, Jesse pointed out, you know, how much water does it make for a t-shirt? Well, how much, let's change our um, functional unit that the life cycle people talk about and talk about how much water is needed to make a kilogram of cotton. 
And one way I like to, the number I like to use, and we've had these discussions at, at Bremen, um, if you take four tenths of a millimeter, so that's not very much, you know, a millimeter, very small, and over a hectare, you'll produce a kilogram of cotton. And when I think of water use in agriculture, I want to use the same units we use to measure rainfall. And so I'm used to looking at the rain gauge in the U.S. It, it reads in inches or, you know, uh, globally in millimeters or centimeters. And that's the depth of water. So that, I think, is the most appropriate unit to use when talking about agricultural water use. But for the, for the moment, let's see how does that translate into, uh, you know, volume units. So that is equal to about 4,400 liters of water per kilogram cotton produced, or 4.4 4 .4 cubic uh, meters per kilogram. Uh, in English units, that's 520 gallons per pound. Now, that's to produce the fiber. Another, you know, important point to remember is, uh, you know, for almost every uh, kilogram of fiber produced, we're producing almost a kilogram and a half of seed. And seed obviously has uh, economic value to the farmer. It's an important uh, livestock feed for dairy cows. It's also used to make cottonseed oil. And so it is, a, it is a very important product that's also coming from the same water. And so if you take the seed cotton use, that becomes 1800 liters per kilogram of seed cotton, so seed and fiber. And so those are kind of our agronomic numbers that I'm pulling from a publication by Zwart, Zwart and Bassetson uh, shown there at the bottom. And that is getting a bit dated. Now, some could criticize use. This is very similar to what uh, Dr. Daystar was talking about in terms of a water footprint of the green plus the blue water use. So this doesn't, isn't really worried concerning where the water comes from. It's all the water that goes through the plant. And that's the water that makes it to the field. So there is a little bit, um, uh, could be water loss on the delivery to that field. And so a true water footprint would be a little bit higher than this, but this is the right order of magnitude. And then if we take, uh, again, back to the functional unit of a kilogram of fiber, uh, from that life cycle study that Dr. Daystar was talking about, that would correspond to 1,500 and uh, 1,560 liters of blue water consumption per kilogram of fiber. So now we know all those terms. That's being very precise. And this is probably my preferred metric to use when talking about how much water does, you know, do we use to make a kilogram of cotton? This is based on, you know, almost 70% of the world's cotton irrigated and non-irrigated. And so that is the blue water, water that's, you know, either removed from a, from a river or lake or the ground to produce a, a kilogram of cotton. So I think that is, when we think about the impact of, of water, uh, that's probably the best metric. Remind, you know, and rem remembering that, you know, less than, uh, 50% of this world's cotton relies on irrigation. So it's, a, it's an important point that, that if we need to, cotton can be produced with only rainfall. So we'll, there's kind of beaten that one to death. I want to go to the next slide and just try to put this into another way to put this into context is uh, if we look at the basic human water needs, there's probably about 50 liters uh, that you directly consume as a person a day. So this would be you know, drinking five liters, uh, flushing the toilet 20 liters, taking a bath or shower 15 liters, and then washing and preparing your food. So that's, that's about what it takes per day. Now, uh, if you think about uh, the water footprint of the food that we consume, that, and this is, goes back to the water footprint network, that's about 2,000 to 4,000 liters per person per day. Uh, so that's, you know, the water to grow our food, and this is not, this is all water though, so this is the, the rainfall and the irrigation, uh, is, is significant. And so if you look at what, you know, ICAC has shown about four kilograms per capita of cotton per year per person, um, that works out, that cotton would take about 50 liters uh, per day. So if you, if you put it in the context of what do we need to clothe ourselves versus feed ourselves, we're really back to that 3% number. I think 3% is a key number uh, for, for cotton 
uh, in terms of its total water use of agriculture, its you know, uh, human, a person's per capita use of water. Uh, it, it's just a, a key value there. So, you know, about 3% of our, our daily water, indirect water needs would be associated with our cotton consumption. So and we'll continue on and get into what, you know, how much water does cotton need? Um, this is going back to these depth units of centimeters on the y-axis. And these are different crops uh, that we can look at how cotton compares. And this is in one specific, very arid environment in Arizona. So this is uh, what, where the, we'll talk about this in a second. The highest area of water needs for cotton uh, is in this scenario. But you can see cotton's kind of in the middle of all these different crops. Uh, and, and you can see it compares to a Bermuda lawn. It uses less water than, uh, than someone's lawn. So uh, on an absolute basis, it's not a huge water user. And if we look at the next slide, this is where I want to talk about some people say, how much water does cotton need? And it really depends on the environment. So on the left here, we have a chart of weekly water use. So sum up uh, the centimeters of water used in seven days uh, versus the, the weeks past planting. So that's the x-axis. Uh, and on the left is an arid region. So that would be like Western China, the Western United States, um, parts of Northern India. And then on the right, we have a humid area. So that might be like in, in Brazil, in the eastern and central United States, in, um, in eastern China. So these are two different con growing conditions and also different growing seasons. So we have a long season crop on the left and a short season crop on the right. These are both uh, Gossypium her um, hirsutums. So both the same species, different varieties grown in different environments. The green line is how much water the crop uses. The blue line is how much water the atmosphere could absorb, uh, absorb. So that's called potential ET. So when it's very dry, very hot, um, the, the atmosphere can take up a lot of water when we have long sunny days. That's why the, the blue line is much higher on the left chart than on the right, uh, as opposed to where it's cloudy, and humid, the, the, the atmosphere just can't take as much water. So it's independent of the crop. It's really about the, the psychometrics of the atmosphere. And so as we can see in these examples, it really in a, an arid season uh, can take about twice as much water as a humid area. Uh, but then notice the fiber yield. There's almost twice as much fiber when we have a long season where we have a cotton likes it warm where we have a lot of sunshine, that plant's very productive. So we get a lot more cotton. So the amount of cotton per water use is very similar. Uh, the, but you know, the, the uh, actual, should say, yeah, the water consumption is very similar, uh, but the, the total water uh, used at that location is different. So, and this is really when we talk about, is it organic, is it conventional, is it GMO? Uh, it really, what matters is the environment that cotton grows in is ultimately going to be the, the real factor that determines how much water it needs. So in this example, we can go from, you know, about 60 to 120 centimeters, depending on the environment. So with that, I just want to talk about a final few points. Um, one, I mentioned, you know, that, uh, that Zwart paper and some of the water footprint data is for, really goes back to the late 1990s and early 2000. And so you can see we've made a lot of progress. This is global cotton yield uh, shown in green and the yellow is you know, global cotton land use. And you can see we've been very flat in the amount of land that we're using. So we're not taking more land from rainforest or natural ecosystems, but we're increasing productivity. Um, and one of the things we know that's really fascinating to me is a lot of these improvements have been from better pest control and better genetic gains and yield. And so we are seeing this yield increase come without increased water use. Now, I don't have data on a global basis to back that statement, but if we go to the next slide, I will use the US 
as a, as a case study to show, again, we see that yield increase, which is the green line. Um, and then the blue line represents irrigation water use. And so you can see in the US, our yields have been going up, our water use has been going down. And that's what leads to that really um, incredible improvement that, that Jesse showed earlier, that 80% increase in, in uh, water use uh, in the US. So these are, and I think these trends are, are global. We just don't have the data hand, uh, readily available to demonstrate that, but that is a great story for cotton. We are making more and not using more. And in some cases we're using less. So that is a great trend that we want to continue and so there's different ways that we're going to be working to make that uh, continue. If we look again, going back to the next slide, uh, talking about our goals, again, using data from the U.S., we've seen uh, a great you know, drop of 23% historically, and we're hoping to uh, maintain that pace. So you can see we've, we've cut back. We said we, our future 10-year uh, goal is a, an 18% improvement. And one thing, if you look, that, act, that chart is an inch of water to make a pound of cotton. So uh, if you can look, if we extrapolate that, once we get past uh, 2025, you can see that it, it would become a negative number, which I guess would mean if you plant cotton, it begins to rain or, or water comes out of the ground. I'm not sure how that would work. In reality, uh, we're entering into a nonlinear phase of that relationship. And so we couldn't keep that same linear trend. So we had to back off a little bit to be realistic. Uh, but that is our goal, and I'm not going to go into a lot of details. One example I want to show in the next slide is I think, you know, this is an opportunity when we look at the threats of climate change, uh, the climate models predict for a lot of parts of the globe, we're going to see uh, more erratic rainfall patterns where we may see uh, maybe equal quantity of water, but it's going to come in very intense storms over very short periods of time. And so, you know, there's been, uh, in this ICA series, there was a great, you know, past webinar on, on soil health and improving soil health. Uh, there's a lot of opportunities there globally. Another one that I really think we need to be given a lot more attention to is an old fashioned concept, but of using farm ponds to capture runoff on the farm. So I do, you know, there are gonna be rainfall events that are gonna exceed the capacity, even with a cover crop, even with a healthy soil to absorb that rainfall. And we want to capture that on the farm so that it can be used later when there's a episodic drought. So uh, I think farm ponds are going to be really important part of our, our water management strategy and water adaptation strategy for future climate change. Uh, there's a lot of other things we're working on. And if we look at the next slide, I've got a reference to a paper that uh, where we tried to, to capture kind of a review style paper of a lot of the technologies, both in improving water scheduling and improving water delivery to the farm, whether that's, if that's improved irrigation systems that have led to those uh, decrease in, in water use for cotton. Uh, so that QR code on the top would, will take you to a open access paper that's shown there. And then also on our water, on our cotton cultivated site, we have a lot of um, water tools for farm, kind of farmer oriented that's shown there on the bottom. So if you're interested in some of that, you could take a look at that QR code. Um, so with that, I think we're about ready to, to wrap up and just a few final comments on the next slide is just, you know, to recap, I think it's really important that 3% number, we use 3% of agricultural water, uh, consume 3% of agricultural water, not all water heat and drought tolerant. We use less water in a grassland lawn. Uh, you know, that number is about 4.4 cubic meters per kilogram of fiber. Um, and again, that 3% of, of a person's water consumption uh, per capita water consumption is probably related to their, their cotton use. And so we are working continuously to try to make cotton even more efficient. And with that, I want to turn it back to Dr. Daystar for a final, a few final closing comments. Thank you very much, Dr. Barnes. That's a really great in-depth overview of uh, cotton and how it interacts and requires water throughout its cycle. So we have certainly more content available if this is of interest to you. There's some archived webinars where we explain and 
go into more detail around the water metrics at cottonworks.com. Additionally, uh, in an, a few weeks uh, on July 20th, we'll be giving a similar webinar at Cottonworks. And also at Cotton Today, there's more information around cotton and water use and consumption, as well as a fact sheet, as you see here on the right side, which gives you the kind of the top line data around cotton and water that makes it very easy for you to kind of have as a reference sheet. And of course, if you have more questions beyond what we cover here, our emails, both Dr. Barnes and myself are listed here, and we're here to help uh, help you better understand how cotton requires water and how we measure that and what that means to society and sustainability. So we're here to help. And I guess at this point, um, just like to thank you for the opportunity to present around this important topic. And then we can turn the floor over for questions. Thanks. Well, thanks, uh, Jesse and Ed, for a, a really interesting uh, presentation. And uh, you really highlighted uh, one of the real difficulties, which is getting us to talk the same language. Uh, the difference between use and consumption. And, and that most probably goes a long way to why we have wildly differing figures all over the place. And no one seems to be able to agree on whether it's the amount of water that cotton uses or consumes. So um, I think that's a big challenge of how we do start to all talk the same language. But, um, but you've set us on the right track here as well. So that's, that's I'm really grateful to that. Uh, and I should make a, a comment really about the fantastic work that the, that's been happening in the US um, to not only increase yields, but um, to reduce um, um, so many things like cotton, uh, like uh, water usage, uh, fertilizer usage, etc. cetera. Um, that's been a, a fantastic achievement over the, the past um, years. Um, so we have a few comments coming in. Um, let me see. Um, Right. Um, let me start with one from Dr. Zane. Is there any correlation between cotton root volume and water use stroke consumption? I'll take a shot at that one. And um, really what controls the amount of water that, that flows through the cotton plant is the leaf area. And so uh, the bigger the plant in general, the, the more water it can use. Uh, so the root volume is really about the plant having access to the below ground water. That said, so if you have a bigger root volume uh, and it gives you access to more stored water, in a sense, that plant could would have access to, uh, to a greater amount of water and, and technically would, could use more water, would be less prone to uh, to periods of drought. Thanks, Ed. Um, Sebesh talks about the, the use of um, uh, water, uh, along with chemicals for bleaching and dyeing, etc., cetera, um, in the textile value chain. Um, and he, he asks, what could be the solutions to overcome it for sustainability? Um, I'll start with that one. Certainly, there, there has been, you know, and require the textile processing uh, manufacturing requires a, a significant amount of water, uh, whether that be to create the energy, um, but that doesn't create a lot of pollution, but mainly the, the, the dyeing and finishing, you have a significant amount of water that is not only required to be heated, but also chemicals in that slurry. So that requires a lot of energy, but what happens once we're done with that, certainly that water in the processing is important. Uh, in some areas of the world, there is great uh, robust uh, governmental um, requirements on wastewater treatment. In other areas, uh, there may be those, maybe they're followed, maybe they're not. So I think it's important to, to realize that, that you know, there's ways to clean that effluent or that wastewater up, um, but we need to implement those and make sure that those technologies and those processes are actually being used effectively. Another important point is we are at Cotton Incorporated working with researchers and different companies to better understand and to pioneer areas where we can actually reduce the amount of water required to, for example, dye your clothing. Um, Levi's, amongst others, have looked at um, technology that actually uses foam instead of a liquid bath. We use foam in order to dye the, the garments, uh, indigo dye, for example. And that actually reduces the amount of energy required to heat that by, I, I think, 60 to 70%, as well as reduces the water in a similar magnitude. So there are technologies being innovated around this. And with science-based targets, uh, 
uh, that brands have at reducing greenhouse gas emissions, I think that will actually be another catalyst towards exploring and pioneering as well as implementing these new technologies that will have a co-benefit of reducing the amount of water uh, needed and as a result, the amount of pollution that is emitted to the environment. Thank you, Jesse. Um, from um, Dr. Tabib, mulching in cotton fields can increase water use efficiency. What irrigation method um, would you prefer to grow cotton in the hilly slope areas and in the plainlands? Now that's a, that's a good question. And one of the challenges we sometimes see with a cover crop, if you're using surface irrigation, that cover crop can make it difficult to move the water across the field. And then when you have high slopes, it's difficult to, uh, to, to apply the water in an efficient manner. So uh, one, one thing that works well in that situation is if you can do, you know, you've heard of contour planting where you plant along the uh, perpendicular to the slope of the land. And so with, uh, especially with precision guidance, but I think even without that, uh, doing kind of contour drip irrigation. So uh, we're, we're following the contour of a land, varying drip tubes, and then you can deliver the water very efficiently. But it's important with, with the drip irrigation, some of them can compensate to some extent for elevation, but you really need to, to still be conscious of the slope uh, when you're doing that. So that is one solution. Thank you, Ed. Um, so this one's from Dr. Singandup. Um, how can we introduce auto irrigation systems in cotton crop, particularly in flood irrigation systems where the field application efficiency is about 69% and the rest of irrigation water goes as deep percolation? I'll take that one. This is a fun engineering one. Uh, so this is, you know, this is a challenge we face everywhere that we use flood irrigation. And I want to start out by saying flood irrigation can be very efficient because you can put on a lot of water in one application and limit uh, surface evaporation. So when the soil gets wet, a lot of that water can just directly evaporate. And so the less frequently you do that with something like surface irrigation, it can actually be more efficient than a, a sprinkler irrigation. Uh, the, the question at hand is how you prevent deep percolation. There's a couple ways that we have figured out to do that. One is called surge irrigation. And so uh, you actually have a, a valve in the middle of the field and you, you pump one side of the field for a certain amount of time and that water starts to head across the field and then at a, at a high volume and then you stop pumping. So now you've moved a lot of water all the way across the field fairly uniformly. Now you pump the other half of the field and while the other, other side is infiltrating and, that, and you go back and forth. And so that allows you to use a higher volume of water to get more uniform uh, distribution of depth and less deep percolation. Another uh, way that ha has been addressed, it, they call it, uh, well, you basically, for flooded fields, you flood one field and then it's called drain back irrigation. Then you drain that into an adjacent field. And, and again, what it's about is getting a high volume of water across that field very quickly that allows you to have a very uniform uh, infiltration across the soil profile. And then you move that water into the to adjacent field and you kind of stair step it down uh, uh, from adjacent field to adjacent field, and it uh, allows you to limit that deep percolation. Thank you. There's, um, there's a couple of questions from the director of CS, uh, CICR. Um, I'm going to leave those to last, I think. It was one's just come in, because I think that's a good one to end on. Um, there's one from uh, Dr. Badal. Um, from the pragmatics research team and his question is related to water use practices is there any water use package or practices developed under assured irrigation plots and how efficiently control drip irrigation as advised in the presentation and well i think that means how efficient is control drip irrigation uh, as you uh, put it mentioned in the presentation i.e. the minimum water usage. 
Um, I guess I'll take a, a shot at that to start with. Um, yeah, you know, the, the drip, again, every drip is a good system. And I, I want to, I hesitate a little bit because I don't want one, someone to say everybody should use drip irrigation because that's not true. Uh, but the positive, one of the things I forgot to point out in those charts, when you look at the early season, while the plants are very small, there's very little transpiration. And when you see a spike in the, in the actual ET uh, approaching potential ET, that's when the soil surface has become wetted. And so with a drip irrigation system, that is, you can you know, probably get in certain situations compared to, a, say, an irrigation pivot, uh, 20 to 30 percent water savings because you're not wetting that surface. Um, and so uh, there is there is definitely advantage to that. You can do it frequently so you can kind of spoon feed the water as the plant needs it. So there are definitely advantages. Of course, the disadvantages are it's a, an expensive system and it's very hard to maintain. It requires a lot of inf uh, filtration. Uh, you have to have the right water quality. Uh, so while it is a, it's a great irrigation system, it is not one that I would, you know, say that it works for everybody. Sorry. Um, thank you, Ed. And um, Dr. Kumar makes a comment that irrigating the crop in alternate furrows saves nearly 40% in water and um, in a ridge furrow planting system. Um, which is worth mentioning. Now I'm going to la leave the last um, um, question before we have to shut um, to the director of um, CSICR, uh, uh, which is, um, well, he's asked two questions. Um, um, can you share some data, throw some light on, uh, on cotton water productivity, the water footprint across the cotton growing countries? And I think most probably, uh, Dr. Granthi, we could we can certainly do that, uh, or we can certainly do that with uh, Cotton Incorporated. Um, but the question really is, why and how cotton, how why and how is cotton considered a thirsty crop when the reality presented by you is quite the opposite? Jesse, I'll let you get started. Yeah, I can warm this one up for you. Um, yes. <laughs> That, that's a big conversation. I think we could probably talk for another hour about that. Uh, we won't, however. I, I think that uh, there has been some key data points uh, and misinformation that has been propagated from various organizations, and that has been detrimental to Cotton's reputation. A big part of my job at Cotton Incorporated and Chief Sustainability Officer is to convey correct and accurate information, improve uh, the audience's uh, literacy around sustainability, particularly water, and to uh, call out and correct misinformation as it exists on the internet and during presentations. And I do it regularly and it continues to be, you know, I could spend most of my time doing that if I had, uh, you know, more time to do that. So I think there has been certainly, cotton is a big player in the fiber space. And I think we have been, um, you know, an easy target for many years. Um, that being said, the tides are turning. I think that cotton has responded. I think that globally and particularly United States, Australia, and a few other regions uh, with the help of organizations such as the Better Cotton Initiative and the U.S. Cotton Trust Protocol, the cotton industry is now having a proactive message and strategy and real progress towards improving sustainability. We're turning the tides, uh, I think, more so as to say we're part of the solution and other fiber types, whether it be rayon, viscose, or polyester, you know, they need to catch up. So I, there is a turning of tides. And I think we have, um, with the efforts from organizations such as ICAC, Cotton Incorporated, National Cotton Council, we are now communicating at a greater level, dispelling these misinformations and really making a big difference. So uh, I think that that will continue to be there. We'll continue to hear these rumors, but uh, at a lesser extent, as more accurate information has prevailed. Yeah, thank you, Jesse. And, and I just want to back that up because um, before we never really um, worked together on a global level to dispel these myths. And and over the last couple of years, that's exactly what we've been doing um, through the uh, the private sector advisory panel um, and working together to um, dispel those myths. 
um, ICAC has produced um, a, a video um, talking about um, uh, cotton and water usage so um, and getting that out to the public. And so it's really important moving forward that we all work together on these common messages. And, uh, and part of that, of course, is getting our terminology correct. And so we're all talking the same language. Um, but uh, we're, we're seeing that happen now and we're seeing us all working together um, to, um, to help that, um, that happen. Yes. Um, and Kai, I'd just like to add a bit, uh, the director CIC I was also asking for data mm -hmm. on different countries and the water productivity. Uh, our latest cotton data book has uh, a lot of information on that, the country-wise blue water footprint, as well as the green water footprint. So um, I can provide a copy to him. And, and one more nuance to that. Uh, in many countries, there's more difference in different regions in the country than there is between country A and country B. So yeah. uh, it, you have to consider how useful is it looking at a country basis versus a <laughs> other, other lenses or is a global average effective too? So good questions. Uh, yes. I, I agree, Jesse. Actually, it is, uh, I mean, uh, like this part was extremely difficult to get the actual quantities of water withdrawn. Uh, some countries did provide us, but when we started getting deeper into the data, uh, that was a nightmare. But nevertheless, because we thought it would be, uh, it would give an idea as to how much of irrigation water would be consumed. This is sort of, it is, um, I mean, it does provide numbers, but I would say that uh, all of us need to consider them with a, you know, uh, with a bit of caution. Uh, I mean, there's nothing like what is the exact amount of water used for cotton. Nobody can ever get closer to that. So, yeah. so I, I think with that, um, I'm going to have a, I'm going to make a plug for the ICAC Cotton Data Book, which is, um, if you're on um, social media, you'll see it, seen it's been advertised today, but it's over 550 pages packed with um, um, information, statistical information. And, uh, and the beauty of it is that you know, it keeps getting bigger and bigger as we keep adding more and more. And, um, uh, and we've got big plans to add more and more chapters in, into that book. So um, get, get hold of a copy, buy a copy. Um, it's gonna be extremely useful to you. Um, uh, I want to just make a, a comment now. This is the last of the series of webinars. Um, uh, we, I told you that um, the World Cotton Research Conference will um, be next year now, in October next year, 2022. Um, however, we will look at um, um, seeing if we can provide a second series of webinars in the lead up to that, um, that conference uh, for you. So that really leaves me to thank... Um, uh, all our presenta um, presenters uh, through all of the 10 series and especially today for two very interesting presentations. So thank you, um, Venu, uh, Jesse and Ed. Uh, we greatly appreciate that. Um, to thank our um, everyone who's done the uh, interpreting in the background, um, especially when we're talking so fast. I know that I have tried to slow down a little bit. And um, my last thanks must go to you who have attended these, pre these webinars because without you, there's no point in holding a webinar. So thank you very much indeed. I hope that you have learned something and it's been interesting. I have certainly learned something and it's been interesting to me. So with that, thank you and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you.